Well, good morning, Walden Church. How was your week? <laughs> if you don't know, Texas uh, went through a pretty bad storm this past week. And, you know, we knew the storm was coming for a while, and we were all supposed to use our time wisely and prepare. And, of course, at our house, we figured, ah, pfft, what, what could possibly happen? And uh, we, used, we used our time to buy ice cream and raw meat. That's how Joanna and I prepared our home for the storm. <laughs> but, you know, life is like that. You realize too late that you wasted your time. If we had only used our time better, we could have taken advantage of the opportunity. So I want to talk to you this morning about finding time. And I want to start this with three facts, okay? And, and you can agree or not, but I'm, I'm pretty sure these are true. And the first one is, you will always find time to do the things that you want to do, right? You'll always find time to do the things that you want to do. I often say that I don't have time to exercise or that I don't have time to eat healthy. That's a lie, right? I totally have time to exercise. I just don't want to exercise. We always lament that there's never enough time in a day, but there are. Joanna and I say that we never have time to go out on a date or read a book or play a board game with the kids, but the truth is there's time to do all those things. The reason I know this is because other people find time to do those things and we all have the same 24 hours that everybody else has. CEOs, leaders of countries, celebrities, inventors, they all have the same time to do their work. God doesn't give some people 30 hours a day and other people 10 hours a day. Every one of us gets 24 hours a day. Every one of us has 60 minutes in that hour. Every minute has 60 seconds in that minute. We all get the same time every day, but each of us determines how we are going to spend those time. Somebody once said, we treat our time like we treat our money. And when it's gone, it's gone because you can't make more time. All you can do is find time. See, time has already been made and we can't make any more of it. All we can do is prioritize how we use our time. Do you know on average people spend about one third of their lives asleep, which is 318 months taken up by just lying in bed. Americans will spend about 37 billion hours waiting in line each year, which is roughly equivalent to six months of your life. Men shave on average 200,000 times in their life, which is about five months of their life. And outside of all of those mundane facts, each of us has ambitions and dreams and goals that we would all like to pursue if only we had the time. But we do have the time. We're just doing something else with it, like shaving. You know the author Stephen King? Yeah, writes all the scary books. <laughs> He's written 77 books. 77. You know what question he gets asked the most? When do you find the time to write all these books? Has anyone ever asked you about your hobby or a project that you worked on? How did you make time for that? Nobody makes time. We can't make time. We find time. Last week, we read a verse from Solomon Wisest man who ever lived. The Bible is full of the wisdom that he acquired in his lifetime. Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, the first line of chapter 3 says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Seems like a very simplistic outlook, doesn't it? As we all watched the hurricane coming toward us and after the power went out, how many of us thought, I don't have time for this. But Solomon says, no, you do. There is a time for us to do the necessary things in life. 
All we have to do is decide what is important and what we want to spend our time on. Every one of us receives an equal amount of time. The only difference between us is how we spend it. I would love to write a book. People have told me, you should write a book. I always smile and say, I wish I had time. It's very easy for us to look back and feel like that we missed out on time. But I think the other fear is looking ahead, right? Looking ahead and wondering how much time we have left. We are all aware of how life moves very quickly, silently, unsuspectantly, and we're also very aware of how time runs out. I know that you've all experienced a time in your life when a sudden deadline came and you weren't ready, or you had to finish a project and you were running a little bit late, or you're having to take the kids to school, they're gonna be late. So we're all very much aware when time runs out. I know that you've all experienced uh, frustration in looking ahead and looking at the time that we have left. And we, and we look ahead at the time that we have left and we turn our minds to worry and anxiousness and we become frustrated because we only have to look back to realize that time has moved so fast, that things have changed so quickly. And it seems like we were just in high school, but a glimpse ago. And at one point we were a teenager and then we were married, and then in a flash we turned around and now it's just a struggle just to get out of bed. It's frustrating, isn't it? Do you know the story of Esther? It's a very well-known story to the Jewish people. It's a short book, it's only 10 chapters, but it records the faithfulness of a young Jewish girl who was born into slavery. Darius was the former king. He was the king when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Well, his son, King Xerxes, had just banished his wife from Persia, and he was seeking out a new queen from all the women in his kingdom. And this is when the young Esther was chosen to be queen of Persia and the wife of a Persian king. Esther was probably quite comfortable with her ordinary life, didn't like the idea of being cast into publicity as a queen. I'm sure she would have rather stayed at home and been an ordinary girl, but God had other plans for her life. Does that sound familiar to anyone? I used to watch Little House on the Prairie with my mom when I was a kid, and I never once thought that I would have to live like them for a week. Sometimes life throws you a curveball, and we ask, why is this happening to me? I don't have time for this. Esther felt that same pain in her life too. She couldn't understand why God would allow her to marry a pagan king, to be taken away from her family, to live in a palace, but to feel more like a prisoner than a queen. Now the other character in the story is a man named Mordecai. Mordecai was Esther's relative, but also her guardian. And he sent her a message to the palace. And it said, Esther, you have a new life. You have a new job, and you can use your new job to help people. To which Esther said, my new job sucks. Actually, that's not what Esther said. What she said was that according to the laws of Persia, she could not even go to her husband without prior approval. If Esther was to attempt to walk into the presence of the king without permission, he could have her killed. But what Mordecai wanted her to see was, the same thing that Solomon tells us. There is a time for everything. And maybe, just maybe, he says to Esther, this is your time. Esther 4.14, he says, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So you don't have the greatest job in the world. So what? It's too demanding. It's not exactly what you thought. You know what? There are no perfect jobs out there, none. Every one of us must choose to listen to God and just make the best situation that we can. The Roman poet Ovid, he once wrote, the harvest is always more fruitful 
in another man's field. Sounds a lot like what we say today. The grass is always greener. I just have to find a better job, we think. I just have to find a better church. I just have to find the right person to marry, and then I will have a better life. It's not the job. It's not the church. It's not the spouse. It's not your circumstances that determines your happiness. It's our attitude. It's our attitude in the midst of that circumstance that determines our happiness. Abraham Lincoln once said, a man is about as happy as he makes his mind up to be. That means you determine your own happiness by your own attitude. Don't allow your circumstance to steal your joy. I know life can feel like it's unfair. I didn't enjoy sleeping without air conditioning or throwing away two refrigerators full of food. I didn't enjoy checking the energy map every 30 minutes or watching all the other house, houses get power except mine. I know that life is hard sometimes, but we must learn to trust God and to bring into our path those that he wills and to help us in whatever circumstances come our way. Esther came to realize that God had placed her in the palace of the king for that specific time, for that specific purpose. And all the hours of loneliness that she felt, the separation from her family and friends, all the while questioning why God would allow this to happen, wondering why she was destined to carry such a heavy burden in her life, they were answered because God used her to save her people. And perhaps, just like Queen Esther, you have been brought to this place in your life for such a time as this. For such a time as this, God is calling men and women and young people all over to work in his kingdom. For such a time as this, God has prepared you to teach a class or to minister to the lost and the sick or to help the hurting around you. God has a purpose for your life within the circumstances of your life. If you put your trust in him and allow him, you can bless others. So, what pieces of advice would I give? I think first, find some time for yourself. You know, at first class, glance, that seems like a pretty selfish statement. And I know that some of you would tell me that we already spend way too much time on ourselves, but that's not what I'm saying. See, God made a big investment in you. He made you special. And in creating you, and not just making some cookie-cutter, ordinary individual, but he made you with his divine wisdom, it should be up to us to discover the people that God has made us to be. Ephesians 4 says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Have you found time to do that? Put on the new self? Last week we said none of us are done growing, right? We said none of us are done learning. So I think you owe it to yourself, and more importantly, you owe it to God to grow as a disciple. There's so much to learn in this great big world. So let's use our time and improve our knowledge and come alongside others and see the person that God has created you to be using the gifts that God has given you. What gifts and skills has God given each of us that's made us special and unique? What are the best ways that we can use those skills? Second, I would say find time for others. You know, even though it's important to find time for ourselves, we need to realize that we are not alone in this world. Nearly 400 years ago, the English poet John Donne, he wrote, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. In each of our lives are other people, neighbors, family, with whom we coexist. To those people we owe a certain amount of obligation, and that obligation is our time. Many of us have a spouse, many of us have children, all of us have friends, and you cannot maintain a relationship with any of them without putting in a certain amount of time. Hebrews 13 says, let brotherly love continue, 
Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. We saw a lot of that this past week. Neighbors helping neighbors. But it shouldn't take a natural disaster for that to happen. There are so many opportunities to minister to people. But ministry always includes a commitment of time. Ministry doesn't happen in just two-minute time slots. You can't touch people the way Jesus touched people without investing some of your time. There's, so, there's no such thing as instant ministry. And there's no such thing as instant compassion or instant understanding or instant love. Jesus invested three years in his disciples' lives and he's invested a lifetime in every one of us. And if we're going to follow the example of Jesus, then we're going to have to give some time to the people around us. You know, we've been very lucky to find Miss Teresa to work with our young kids, but she can't do it alone. We need Sunday school teachers and nursery workers. We lost our youth pastor a while back, and we've been looking hard to replace them. Our youth is very important to us, and we would love to be a church with a youth group. We'd love to be a church that could minister to families, but we can't do it without help. We need you to find time for others. And last, find time in your life for God. You know, this old world didn't happen by accident, and you are not an accident. In fact, just like Esther, God has a plan for you. And so likewise, God is not just some impersonal force out there, but rather he has a very deep interest in the world and your life. God took time to mold you, to make you who you are. He took time to color your eyes and to form your frame. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. And guess what? That also takes time. It takes time to be still and to know God. This summer, as you take a look around you, gaze up at the stars, stand in the shadow of a mountain, look out over the ocean, let your mind reflect on the fact that this all didn't just happen. There is a designer, so there is a plan. I think all too often when we're spinning all the plates of our lives, and maybe we feel like, I just can't handle one more plate. I'm, I'm pulled in so many dis different, different directions. My, my time is already used up. And perhaps we look at our Christian walk as just that, that one plate that's going to bring everything down. But the truth is, my relationship with God, that has to be the one plate that I give my priority to. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. That means the kingdom comes first with my time. Your life with God comes first. Jesus is saying, if you take care of my kingdom, I will take care of you. It's easy to get busy, though, isn't it? You know, when you see an old friend and they say, Hey, how are you doing? How, how, have, you, how have you been? How was your week? What do we say? I've been busy. It's the same answer we all give. And I am so sick and tired of that answer. We're all busy. And we love being busy. Without power this week, we were all upset that we couldn't be busy. <laughs> but even though you didn't have time in your life for a hurricane, you found time. And in that time, I hope that you also found time for family and for neighbors, maybe even some time for thinking, for praying, and for God. And as life begins to return to normal this week, I hope we can all appreciate the time that we have and the time we have left. Let's find time for the things that matter. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time that is stretched out before us. May we use it wisely. May we find the time to grow with disciples, to love our neighbors, and to serve you. We thank you for 
all the men and women that helped our community this week. Whether it was a neighbor that chose to use their time to help a neighbor, or it was the brave linemen that were up on the poles helping restore power. Whether it was our first responders that were getting to homes where people needed help. Lord, we saw people helping and people loving, people using their time in a time of crisis. And when we all perhaps thought that we didn't have time for this, we found that there was time. May we continue to find time for each other and to find time for you. May we continue to see all the blessings you give us as time stretches out before us. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in today and uh, watching uh, this morning. Of course, I want to remind you that we're here. We are here every Sunday. We have two services. We have one at 9.30, which is more of a traditional service. We're going to sing hymns out of the hymnal, do responsive reading, say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. Then we have an 11 o'clock service, which is contemporary. We have a worship team. Please bring your family. We've got something for children of all ages, and we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.